my talk is on paradigm shift in uh, in aortic valve uh, replacement using this new technique called Osaki aortic valve reconstruction. Uh, from out of, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Agarwal for inviting me to give a talk on this fifth Founders Day uh, meet. And uh, I would disclose uh, Mr. Shankar, he's a distributor of Osaki uh, uh, for, uh, for including me as one of the proctor in doing this uh, Osaki in India. And uh, I would say I have not included any recent changes which was made by Professor Osaki uh, in my presentations. So surgical options for articular disease, we all talked recently just now, there is no one-stop solutions. It is starting from cath lab to surgery. Surgery includes valve repair, replacement, and ROS procedure. And now things come to a non-ROS options. So, I mean, we just just a little little bit of for a postgraduate or any training candidate. So, percutaneous balloon does it increases the effective orifice area by splitting the tissue in the area of least resistance. What does it mean? It not in the commissure usually. Invariably, the valve let, valve leaflet tears and thereby it increases the uh, uh, valve area. But these children will come back to you with the aortic regurgitations. Whereas the surgical valve atomy definitely offers a direct visualization. And thereby, very meticulous commissiotomy can be done. But uh, of course, it needs a, a open wound and a heart lung machine. So uh, coming to the article repair, uh, it is compared to the mitral repair. It's actually difficult to reproduce. Numerous techniques, the lack of standardizations, what Dr. Uh, uh, Elquery and Shafis can do. Not everybody can do it. So it's difficult to reproduce. So article replacement, yes, it's easily done. But it has its challenges especially in a smaller IT canal diameters. Uh, we just know we talked about anticoagulations and well-rated complications, uh, including early degeneration. Coming to the mechanical AVR, yes, it's easy to implant. Definitely it's more, most durable, but it's not, there's no growth potential, especially in younger, younger individuals and high chance of PPM in a, in a children or I would say in a young adolescent, about 20 to 30% by the end of 10 years. The recent paper from Annals of Thoracic Surgery talked about younger age of surgery and smaller processes are risk factors for death uh, during a follow-up after mechanical ABR. Biological, yes, they are very high profile. They're not frequently used in younger individuals. And again, the durability is questioned. I mean, 50% only durable by 10 years and IIT homograft has a limited availability in our country. And we talked about homograft calcification. Obviously, somebody has seen a homograft it's, it's very bad when you do a redo on them. Coming to the ROS AVR, yes, definitely it's advantages of having a growing autologous tissue. It, the, the ROS it restores the survival, survival curve. That's what we talked even yesterday and uh, previously. The, the only dietic values nearly match the survival curve is a ROS operation in, a, in an dietic position. Uh, it also eliminates the lifelong disadvantages for mechanical and a xenograft valves. But remember, it's technically more demanding, a very high steep learning curve, and you are converting a potentially one problem into a two well problem compared to a single well problem. And again, in our country like us, we don't have a freely available homographs, and it's very expensive overall, overall for the patients. And again, RAS is not possible for everybody, especially those who have a post balloon pulmonary valvotomy or a leaky pulmonary regurgitations and patients with truncus. Again, we have to be very cautious in doing a ROS procedure and dilated aortic root because the, the ROS failure is very high in this kind of uh, patients. So that is where the paradigm shift happens. So the shift actually has happened in 2008 in Japan, but we are, we are slowly getting, starting to pick up on that shift. What are the, the paradigm shift happened? So thanks to uh, Professor Osaki. Actually, uh, even though this is kind of modified and everything, but the original description even given by Dr. Durant in early uh, 1950s and 60s. So, but the new uh, new uh, identity is given by Professor Osaki based on his standardization, his techniques. He started doing the procedure since 2008. So what he does, did it essentially replace the damaged aortic valve using a, either native pericardium or a bowen pericardium. It's a three leaflet re reconstruction using the native tissue or a bowen pericardium. So this is what the results came out in Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery in 2018, where he published his 10 years results. His average age of patients around 68.9 years, and uh, the total number of patients were around 850 patients. So 850 patients, mainly an adult, 
mean age of around 68 years. He concluded saying that freedom from regurgitation was 10 years close to 86%. So what are the advantages we talked about? This previous session, we all talked about anticoagulations. Yes, definitely the Osaki avoids anticoagulations. It's reproducible. It's very much reproducible because standardized uh, uh, set, everything is marked. It's very uh, less expensive. And this gives excellent hemodynamics. The gradient at the end of a Osaki AVR, it will be around 10 to 15 at the most. So I just I have a few slides. I'll just go through the few slides about my operative steps. So the basic sets are uh, the... Uh, so leaflet sizer and the cusp sizer, and you have a plate to fix the pericardium. What you see uh, on, in, in the right hand and the left hand corner is a leaflet uh, sizer. I mean, uh, cusp sizer. In the in the in the, uh, in the right hand corner, you have a pericardial uh, leaflet sizer, and the size varies from 13 millimeter all the way up to 35 millimeter. So you can do the Hosaki reconstruction as small as a 13 millimeter root up to 35 millimeter root. So this is what I talked about. One in the middle is a leaflet sizer. One on my right hand is a, a, a cusp sizer. So how do you, so you do a sternotomy, prepare the pericardium and a harvest the pericardium and treat in the children or young adolescents, if you treat it for two minutes, it's more than enough. Whereas in, in anybody's above 65 or 70, you would see the pericardium is very thin where we treat it for about eight minutes. So gulrad head treatment for about two minutes in, in young individuals, in adults are near old, around near six, above 60, we treat for eight minutes. After treating it for six, two minutes, then we just wash the, uh, basically, you know, get rid of all the gulrad head with a three separate saline wash and each saline wash lasts for about six minutes. So essentially within 20 minutes, you get your pericardium ready. By the time somebody opens and harvests a pericardium, when you're trying to go on pump, your pericardium is already ready and you can do one of your assistant or PA who is helping in the theater, they can do this. Just a few uh, small videos just for... Uh, this is a plate. Where we fix a pericardium. Remove all those advantageous uh, over the pericardium. So once you once you prepare. Okay. Once you Once prepare, you prepare, okay. Uh, so you do iota to me, go and pump, do iota to me. So usually uh, uh, I tend to transect the iota and make an oblique cut along the non coronary. So it's like open book, uh, anybody can see. And even with a lower most assistant in your unit can assist you with this procedure. So yeah, iota is transected. So just, you know, I mean, if you have a big iota in an adult, you don't need to do it, but generally I do this. This gives a better exposure and also you can do a root enlargement for a small root with the same same incision, nicks or manager and whatever you want to do, you can do this. So, so the exposure is very key. So once you exposed it, you excise it, uh, you use, you respect the native commissures, that is where your, your reference point and mark appropriate. In, in the case of bicuspid or unicuspid, you may have to move your commissure in, in order to accommodate tricuspid or saki. So this is nothing, this is, I'll just show you. And actually the ideally when you start doing this Osaki, you start off with the rheumatic, you can see this, it's a tricuspid, you thicken and retract leaflets in aromatic patients with the severe AR. And this is the ideal case to start off doing your procedure. Even if you have a calcified uh, valve, just excise it. You don't need to have much tissue because you'll be able to suture it. Because after all, you're suturing the pericardium to the annulus. If there's no rigid material you're trying to suture. So once you excise it, just measure. This is what I talked about, the, 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 the cusp sizer. Uh, you, you use from commissure to commissure. The size is available from 13 to 35. 
this is basically the preoperative echo analysis diameter of the particle patient will give a rough idea. So analysis is about say 19 millimeter, 21 millimeter. You can go either one or two sizes above or at the same size. So 23 millimeter analysis, either you take 23 and size it or 21 or 25, you will get there. So I just want to show you how you size it. So you can see this pretty much exposed nicely. You can see even automatic cut and very beautifully. And then you take the sizer and, and just size from commissure to commissure. This is very important uh, point of, I mean, step of the operation. We tend to use the same size for all three sinuses, but you can use a different sizes. Professor Wasaki initially did that, then finally he changed his technique recently. That's what he said in Bangalore meet uh, last month. So, but you can do either way, I suppose. Both will give the good results. So we've taken a 25 here. So, so the exposure is essential. Measuring is very essential. Then obviously the pericardium. Pericardium, take the pericardium, have a good marking pen uh, because these marks has to be seen when you're suturing it. Three important marks. One is in the central, uh, central uh, dot, uh, central mark then followed by the big bite or uh, the last one, uh, last one we call it as a big bite or a double dot. And the third one is a uh, wing extension, which is not very clear in this uh, thing. I'll show you this. You can see here. Yeah. So the pericardium is prepared. And the, uh, this is, this is the, the, the leaflet sizer, which we talked, and this marking has been done. That's a central mark. You can even count how many dots. It varies from size 19 to 35. And invariably, you start with 6 on either side, 7 and 8. And you have a wing extension, nothing but for a commercial fixations. The double dot is basically tells you it's the last but one dot or a big bite that you know it's going to close your subcommercial area. So the, the bite has to be done a little bit perpendicular to the annulus. The similar way, you mark three leaflets and then cut them all. OK, this is how it looks once you mark it. This is based on your analysis uh, measurement. So then once you've done it, then you just cut the, the leaflets. You can use a different scissor for the bottom. People use a straight scissor and curved scissor. Doesn't matter. Whichever way you do it, you do it. Maybe for the lack of time, I'll just skip this video. So when, once you you once you have a leaf pericardium cut out, then you need to mark it onto the annulus, which basically the midpoint and the commissural. I'll just show you this. No, initially we measured twenty five, and I'm going to mark the, uh, the the important markings on the native annulus. So that is a, that is a center point, an idea of the annulus and the two commissures. Right. You can do the same with all the three annulus. Basically, the center point has to go, you know, your center point of the leaflet has to reach into the center point of the annulus. Maybe I'll, I'll skip. So and then comes to suturing. So you 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 measured, you've taken the pericardium, you marked appropriately on both sides. Now you have to suture it. So when you suture on the on the belly, it initially is a very close suturing. So the this is called three three is to one, where from the midpoint on either side of the three three sutures, we go very close. So three is to one ratio. As we move towards the periphery, you can you can you can space out, you can widen it out. So that'll become one is to one as we move along to the commissure. This is what three is to one. You can see here that the initials are a little closer because that is the belly of the leaflet that is going to withstand the stress of, of the entire pressure. Uh, so that is why it needs to be given a nice important at the, at the level of uh, uh, the, the middle part of the annulus. So we, when you start a suturing, we always suture in the right because it's difficult to do it. So better to do the, do the, the difficult part first. So the first suture has been taken and you move along to either commissure and, and and once you're done with one, go to the other one. So usually we'll do the left, right is, a, is a, the first because that's a difficult. Again, a lot of people have asked me yesterday, which side? So usually the smooth side go to the LV side. The rough side comes to the aortic side. Uh, that's the explanation which uh, we, what we heard from Dr. Wasaki initially when he did it initially, he put the rough side on the LV side and smooth side on the aortic side. 
So he said he found a couple of patients has a platelet damage because of the flow turbulence. So he started reversing it. So, so, but as a, what have we learned that we've been doing the, uh, the smooth side always go to the LB side. So I'll just go to the next. So you suture on either side. It's see the dot, the, this is what the marking is very essential. The dot is there. That's going to tell you where your bites are going to go. Then, then it's, it's very e easily reproducible. When you come to the left, left is, is easy to suture. Maybe you can use. So the right has already been sutured. And the, and the left is easy to suture. Sometimes what you see, the coronary position may get buried. Instead of in the middle, it can go to the close to the commissure. You, bear, you can even shift your commissure to one side in order to avoid the coronaries. So once you suture, once you've done all the three leaflets, this is how it looks actually. The final look comes to like, like a nice three core patient, like the Namaste or Mercedes Benz sign, whatever you want to call it. So this is how it comes. By looking at itself, you know, this is value is going to work. For sure. So, so once you're done like this, so we are not doing anything, no stretch, anything. If you just with a little bit of suction on it, it's all the three leaf. It comes like a cup uh, into the cup and then just stays like that. So the, the once once you're done all the leaflet suturing, the, the second part of the important suture is a commercial fixation, which you can support with a pledget, usually the Teflon pledget, which is outside the aorta. How we, I just want to show you this. Yesterday we demonstrated how you fix it. So it starts from the uh, wing extension mark on the last bite, closes the, uh, the both the leaflets at the level of commissure, just above the commissure, and come outside a little bit above and lateral and fix it with the same at the front part. Uh, Osaki is straight on the needle, needle but, but, but we don't do it. We can do either way, whichever works for you. But... So, you basically you have a four thread lying outside the each commissure, tie it onto the front. Okay, so this is what I talked about I, uh, about the commercial fixation. This is the last white which came out, the, the second of the big extension which comes outside and uh, being tied with the front. You can do additional commercial fixation if you if you like to, or you can don't need to do it. So this is how it looks. All the three pericardium meeting in the center with with a good uh, with a good core patients. So I just want to share our experience. So overall, we have done sixty five patients, out of which aortic Wasaki was in forty, or conduit as in twenty, pulmonary valve Wasaki in five, mean age and weight come pretty much like an young adolescent group, uh, sex predominantly male. And uh, we have done on adult patients more than 40 kilo as well. High distribution, BSA, I'm just skipping for the lack of time. And rheumatic, rheumatic is still almost equal. I would say 40% of the patients are rheumatic and congenital is about 52%. Osaki leaflets, pretty much we do for a three cusp uh, for everybody's. And sometimes we have done a monocusp Osaki. I'll talk about it. Leaflet material by choice. It's a pericardium. But one or two cases where we didn't get a good pericardium in a reduced situation, so we used to bone pericardium. Leaflet size pretty much 23. Look at the timing here. So it, it's a time consuming procedure compared to a standard AVR. So it takes at least one and a half hours to two hours to do it. Initially, it was, we have, timing was 130. Now we have brought down our timing to about 90 minutes as we gain more and more experience. So somebody with a sick LV and sick patients, are, you have to have better micro strategy if you're going to do this. And be prepared. If the valve doesn't work, you still have to go back. So it's not a, like a quick operation. Somebody who's going to begin the uh, begin doing the procedures. Follow up, they do very well. Look at the post op mean gradients, only 10 on average. At the max, we'll get 15. No heart block. When you size it, you, uh, you know, sizing, suturing is all at the annulus are just below the annulus. So you don't need to be so aggressive in taking the sutures. So the heart block is almost nil in our series. The two patients we had to reoperate, one was a, a moderate AR. So we don't accept anything more, more than mild plus at the max. It should be trivial to mild. 
If anything more than that, this valve is going to come back. You need to figure out where it's leaking and try to fix it. Uh, freedom from reoperations at 33 months, about 95, 95%. And uh, Kawasaki valve regurgitation is about 95%. But it's only a short period of time, three years. So this is a couple of papers from across the, <coughs> across the globe. So 57 patients from Boston, they had about 88% at two years freedom from uh, arterial regurgitations. This is from Great Ormond Street, they are about 80%. What are the modification? Use the same technique for preparing the conduit. That conduit can be done either on the, it can be used either on as a bentol or as a rv 2 pa conduit. Also used monocus for Saki in patients with the VSD with the severe aortic regurgitations, more than moderate aortic regurgitations. Our choice is monocus for Saki and in a, in a pulmonary valve replacement in adult patients or a top with absent pulmonary valve. We use these techniques. Uh, I won't go too much about it. Maybe these are the standard which we have seen already. This is what our pericardium. So how do you choose a, a conduit? So you always size whichever. If you think that the aortic side or pulmonary side, you go with the z-score of the particular uh, vessels and then choose a graft. The Wasaki leaflet invariably one size larger than the graft. For example, if you're going to use a 24 millimeter graft, if you go with a 25 millimeter leaflet size. That is pretty much works well. Uh, I'll just, so, so what the important is, we always use the Decron graft, the Marshall uh, Decron graft, stabilize the graft, and then, uh, use a uh, use a marking pen and mark one particular ring as a as a uh, annulus. So you mark it. You create an annulus. Basically, you're suturing the three cusp inside a cylinder. That's all it's all about. So mark it. Then use a sizer based on our graft and one size rather than it. And then mark three commissures and then start suturing it. So you can see a marking center point of the 23 millimeter. So suturing similar to aortic uh, 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 Osaki procedure. You know, once you start suturing, it actually comes up very well. This is how it looks. It's very competent. Uh, you, know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm 100% sure that the, the, the left side, if somebody knows how to make a conduit, it works very well. We are used in only one patient. It's working well. So this is how it looks from inside. So this is in some other patients where I used as RV to pee a conduit. It, See the height, if somebody is doing it properly, then all the height, everything comes in the same plane. It does not leak much. So I have a video, but lack of time, I'll just skip it. So our experience, about 20 patients. So median age is 14. Age distribution is there. Uh, we have is a predominantly RV to PA conduit, only one bentol. Uh, redo in 11 patients. So positions, pulmonary was 18. And um, our congenital. Uh, Atlagas pericardium is, uh, is our choice, 60%. Uh, graft sizes we are using all. If you're going to go smaller graft, it's actually technically difficult to suture three leaflet inside, say 15 millimeter, 60 millimeter. In that scenario, what we've been doing, we started doing it now, we create a more bicuspid Osaki. You can use a bigger size and your preparation time also will come down. It works very well. Uh, there's nothing to complain. This is nothing to do with the graft, but you know, this is all complex. So one patient we lost and one renal functions, no infected endocarditis. Out of my 60 patient, not, no patient has come back with the infected endocarditis, at least so far. So this gradient works well. The follow-up they are doing fine, actually. So this is a couple of, just to show you the, how the conduit leaflets works. So this is how it looks. This is a follow-up echo, 3D echo. So this is on the, on, the, on the ventricular side, how it works. It works beautifully, actually, so far, at least. So advantages is easily reproducible. The commercially available conduit as conjunct surgeon, we know it's, it's Kandagara, it's about two lakhs. It only takes uh, the cost of the, the graft around 25,000. The only thing is it does it takes a lot of operating times and you cannot change it. Once you check in one size, you cannot change it. We don't have a long-term durability. It's very useful in a, in a, in a biomedical repair. This is a couple of work being published in, 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 our, in, in our journals. We have video on the on the CTS net as well. Osaki modification, as I talked, monocus PAVR in five. Um, all of them VSD with severe AR. It works. Other one is a, for an adult patient who needs a pulmonary valve replacement. We go with the same techniques. And even you know infants out of this staff with absent pulmonary, two of them are two months and three months. Uh, I mean, I don't have an access to homograft, and my patient cannot afford for a Kandagra. I, this is very cheaper alternatives, and it works beautifully. So in, in summary. Uh, when do you recommend Osaki AVR? Definitely in a replacement in children, young adolescents, and uh, female in the reproductive age group. Certainly, yes. And early adult who's going to have a mechanical valve and he's going to be on anticoagulations. That is, this definitely is very useful. 
and uh, whoever is contraindicated in, have a contraindication for anticoagulations. And obviously, surgeons working from low resource settings, obviously, I would say a majority of us, surgeon who has no access to homocraft, definitely Vasaki AVR is, is a good tool to have in the surgical armamentarium. So if you ask me personally, where do you place? Obviously, if you can repair the, anybody's valve, that's the best. Uh, but it's not easily done by everybody's. AVR is there, ROS is there. So I feel Osaki uh, Neo AVR falls in the middle. This is my personal view, but if you can repair, that's the best. So in the era of uh, TAVI, because the TAVI, the surgeon, cardiologist is taking over from surgeon. So if you do a mechanical valve for five to 10 years of age, you're going to do reoperate some point in time, say 2025, 20, then after that, what? You are left with no other options rather than going for a third uh, redo. If I have to do Osaki in a small age, at least I can buy some time. It may be five years, maybe 10 years. We don't know the results yet. Then I still have option of doing an AVR, either with a biological or a mechanical or a ROS, and then the TAVI, and then valve and valve. So at least with the Osaki, we can buy some time of before converting into a uh, full, full article replacement. Yes, definitely. I feel it's a paradigm shift in the developing worlds, but are we ready to accept this shift? You know, that we have to answer, each one of us has to answer to ourselves. It's very economical, uh, surgical option developing field, especially in a very young populations. There's no additional valve cost, no foreign material, no anticoagulation. They were talking about the last session, how do you avoid anticoagulation, the problem? Yes. Uh, so, and especially country like us, we don't have good follow-up. So, no anticoagulation, very good hemodynamics. Stainless valve, talking about stainless valve, yes, it has got a very good hemodynamics. And uh, so far, uh, we don't have to operate. I don't think the calcification is going to be as bad as the stainless valve, which we talked in the, in, the, in the last session. What are the limitations? Yes, we don't have the long-term results. Uh, so, so we don't have long-term results. Doesn't mean like we cannot use it. No, I still feel the Osaki is going to fail at some point in time because we know it's a pericardium, but accept it. It should be, it should have in place in our surgical armamentarium. And again, giving a teenager or young patients for five to 10 years of somatic growth with anticulation free time, I think is very valuable. Uh, very importantly, doing an Osaki Avenue does not take away your further option of doing an AVR or ROS. So this is like an additional uh, boost which is available in the surgeon hands. Thank you.